Oi. I'm Diego Perrella. I'm a mining and petroleum engineer, uh, master's in mineral economics. As you know from my previous contribution, I have uh, experience both on the uh, investment banking side, on the sales and trading, as well as the hedge fund industry as a, a portfolio manager. Uh, in addition to uh, that experience, I am also the co-author of The Energy World is Flat, uh, which was the first piece that uh, I contributed to with you and I thought it would be good to do an update. Uh, a lot has happened since. I guess it was about 18 months ago and we were in the middle of the collapse of, of crude oil and uh, our thesis of the flattening of the energy world was starting to play out. In fact, uh, at that point, or, or when we wrote the book, it was thought to be uh, almost science fiction or, you know, to be a bit crazy that uh, we could see a collapse from 110, 120 to, to the 30, 40 dollars. But it did fall in very much in the, in the framework. And uh, it's, uh, I think, with the benefit of hindsight, it'd be good to review some of the key, key pieces. Uh, perhaps start with the battle for supply and then move on to the battle for, for demand. What do we understand, first of all, by the flattening of the energy world? Um, the flattening of the energy world has two dimensions. One is a convergence across energies. So uh, this is talking apples with apples in calorific equivalent terms. Uh, the main loser in that battle was uh, crude oil, which would come closer to natural gas and coal. So the first dimension was across energy. The second piece, which again was very controversial at the time, uh, was the regional uh, convergence uh, across different uh, energies. So we're looking at U.S. natural gas trading at that time at you know two to three dollars a MBTU versus LNG uh, trading uh, over twenty following Fukushima. So the idea of the regional convergence and the cross energy convergence led to this idea of a flatter. Uh, energy world with more abundant, cleaner, and, and cheaper uh, energy. The dynamics that we discussed, uh, it was broadly an analysis of, of forces, and the conclusion that we reached was that it was more of a matter of when, not if, that this would happen. And uh, it put OPEC and the technologies and all the industry in an interesting situation that would eventually lead to, to a lot of the things that we're seeing. So let's look uh, at, the, at the battle for supply. Uh, obviously, we have uh, on the one hand uh, OPEC uh, being a dominant uh, part of the market. We have uh, Shale uh, being the new kid on the block, a, technolo a technology that was thought to be a bluff for a long time, but is consistently demonstrated that it can uh, produce significant amount at uh, relatively low prices. And, uh, and very quickly. Uh, so this is a key dynamic. Unlike the old days in the energy markets that would take potentially 10 to 15 years to develop a field, we're talking about three to six months. So this is a game changer. Initially, the battle was very focused on OPEC versus shale. It was, let's see if OPEC is trying to punish the new kid on the block. But what was very obvious to us, and I think today, is the fact that the real losers here are the marginal cost guys. This is Canada, this is Brazil, this is um, Venezuela and other uh, places like that. So I think as of today, we see shale being uh, or understood more as a real player that is here to stay. And I think it's still early days to see the true potential uh, beyond the US and, and what it means. So in some sense, uh, a lot of similarities to what we saw in the 80s with, with offshore and technologies that uh, I think is one of the key themes, how technology keeps pushing the boundaries in terms of how much volume we can produce and, and at what price. Now, uh, maybe add one piece to, to the battle for supply, and I think that's a very important one to, to watch, which is what I would call the energy currency wars. And I would divide the uh, energy producers in three main categories. You would have first uh, Russia, uh, what I would describe as a flea, free floating uh, currency. So we saw oil collapsing and Russia didn't spend a lot of time fighting that they actually let the currency go with it in a way that crude in rubles uh, didn't change that much. That uh, effectively was helped by, by a number of, of, of issues. In, in, you know, Russia has uh, obviously many other things. It's not just oil, it's gas, but it's also metals, it's axe. So overall, they had to take some tough measures, you know, hiking rates and, and, and doing certain things, but it allowed them to stay in the oil game. And that's something that at the end of the day, the producers behave in many ways uh, according to their uh, signals in, in domestic currency. So they didn't feel that pinch that much. The other extreme are uh, basically the 
pegged currencies, the oil pegged currencies. Who are they? Obviously the US, who produces in dollars, but then the Middle East. And this is a very important consideration because every dollar that the oil price moves lower or higher translates into one dollar uh, revenue for, for them in local currency. So you have these two extremes, a free float and a, and a fully peg. And then you have in the middle a bunch of guys that effectively uh, have the currency to shelter or shield themselves somewhat or simply create uh, a response to the conditions. And I think in that sense, Canada is, is a very interesting example where, you know, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, and we, I think, discussed this in, in detail, uh, Canada being a high marginal cost producer, you would expect that sustainable low energy prices, crude oil prices would lead to write-off in certain oil producing assets. It would lead to unemployment, it would lead to reduced investment, it would lead to potentially issues on the banking side, and it would lead to slow down economic activity, lower interest rates, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which are, are all prompt into effectively a weaker uh, Canadian dollar. In that sense, what you see is that as these currencies become weaker, uh, they can basically hold better uh, the, the potential collapse in oil. And I think that's a, a variable that was uh, interesting to watch as oil was collapsing and is something that we need to watch going forward because it's not just about the dollar price, it's also about the effect of these, uh, these currencies. So the battle for supply is very much in a phase where it's uh, obvious today that there's plenty of oil, uh, there's competition between the producers, and uh, in, in that sense, we're in a situation where OPEC is being forced, and, or ROPEC, as I would call the extension with Russia, to come into the table and, and do something. And this poses a very difficult uh, dilemma for, for OPEC, because at the end of the day, one of the key issues that we discussed in, in the book is that the success of OPEC is not really about an oligopoly of supply. It's not about, I, I have the oil, therefore I can control the price. What has happened is they've been very successful because they had a monopoly of demand. That is, in particular, transportation demand. So they have benefited greatly from the fact that the globalization has led to a steady growth in demand. And for decades, crude oil has had very little uh, competition in terms of uh, transportation. So this is the old world. This is a, the, the battle for supply. This is the old dynamics which leads us to, to the second part of the story, which I think is the arguably not well enough understood or still somewhat uh, neglected, but it's really the core of where the flattening of the energy world comes, which is the battle for demand. And what it means is that for the first time in history, crude oil is having to fight uh, for, for that demand, uh, and be it in the form of uh, the super cycle in, in gas and LNG and the energy broadband that, that we discussed, uh, and how supply creates demand in the form of gas or electric cars or many other forms in which uh, uh, we're able to, to move around. Because at the end of the day, we don't need oil per se. Okay, this is not the Mad Max world movie where we're, you know, the last barrel of oil will be worth millions. No, the last barrel of oil will be worth zero. Okay, because it's not about oil, it's about transportation. So if we have, you know, as consumers, cheaper, cleaner, uh, ways to, to move ourselves and, and achieve our need of transportation, we'll do that. It's not really about oil. And I think that's an issue that is still potentially not well enough understood. So worth talking maybe a little bit about OPEC's dilemma. And uh, I think by the time this piece is, is published, uh, we will know the, the outcome from, from the upcoming meeting uh, in Algiers. But uh, just to put things in context, and you know, going back to, to the book, we had this chapter called uh, the BTU that broke OPEC's back, okay? which was a clear analogy to, to the straw that broke the camel's back. And this, is, this was a scenario where now with the benefit of hindsight, we can see how at 110 or 100 and plus uh, dollars a barrel, shale coming in at, let's say, 50 was making a killing. Okay? It's very obvious now that if OPEC was willing to keep the oil price there, uh, everything's, you know, set to was demand being equal, shale would take a significant amount of market share, just as it was so economical that that production would continue to grow. So that, which was pretty obvious to us at the time of, of, of writing and in our view, combined with the other reasons, would potentially put OPEC back into the dilemma that they faced in the, in the 80s. So just to give a bit of history, uh, OPEC at that time felt, you know, uh, after the, the crisis in the, in the 73, 79, et cetera, 
um, Saudi decided, you know, the world needs our oil, we have it, and as a result, um, you know, we're going to provide it to them at, at our own pace and the right price. So uh, with that perspective of we control the oil, we control the price, uh, there was a pretty big response from the consumers. The consumers defend themselves in multiple ways. So from the supply side, you know, we go offshore and, and discover fields in the North Sea, in West Africa, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we introduce uh, significant measures in terms of, you know, uh, mileage for the cars. We introduce uh, all, all sorts of, of, uh, of measures effectively to reduce that dependency. You know, we go for renewables, we go for, you know, solar, we go for all these, all these uh, ways, even drive using corn uh, to, to feed the car. So anything we can think of just to reduce that, that uh, dependency. Now, through that period of time, uh, effectively, Saudi was, you know, to, in order to keep the prices at a certain level, they had to cut their uh, production and as a result, reduce their, they reduce their market share. And they went from over 10 million barrels to 9, to 8, to 7, to 6, until uh, 1986, they get to 2.2 million barrels. So at that point, Saudi says, you know what, we miscalculated, the supply response has been bigger than anticipated, the demand response has been bigger than anticipated, and at the end of the day, we're losing a lot of market share. We're losing our contacts in the industry. Come on, we are the low marginal cost producer. Let's let's open the taps and, and make sure that we are the ones that are delivering that oil. And you know, from there, we got $10 oil and the Soviet Union and the rest is history. So the parallelism with, with shale is significant, right? We're facing a situation where we know that at certain prices, the new technology is going to eat in into that market share. So this is the dilemma for OPEC. Do I keep the prices high enough and enjoy a very significant uh, you know, income at the expense of, over time, reducing my, uh, my market share with the risk that that response is big enough that at one point I need to fold, right? So that's what they did in the 80s. It didn't work very well, okay? The answer was, what do we do now? Uh, do we go and do the same thing or do we take a proactive uh, measure? And that's what they did on the 29th of November uh, 2014, which led to let's let the market forces play. Uh, I don't think uh, they or anyone really anticipated that we would go as low, as low as we did. And this is partially explained by, you know, the battle for supply, the positioning, but, but also the, the currency, the energy currency wars that we, we discussed. So I think looking forward, what we're really seeing is a scenario and, you know, where the addition of Russia to the table to me is very, very significant. I think ROPEC, as I like to call them, have, are significantly more powerful than the old OPEC. Okay, we're talking about, for once, not just one uh, player leading the cuts and taking the pain, but potentially two. Now, uh, obviously, the, the battle for supply is real. Uh, for Russia to just stay still means cut relative to expansion plans. So that's already uh, giving you an indication of, of what the supply side looks like and the ability to grow even at these prices. Um, so I think from an OPEC perspective, uh, my humble personal view is that they, they should, there's a rationale for them to do something, to do something significant that will send prices to the right level where they basically get all that uh, revenue and windfall for a number of years. Uh, because just trying to uh, price out uh, supply or try to, to price out the threat of substitution, uh, it's going to be a path dependent story. It's hard to make the numbers. But uh, I think that all in, the producers have a strong case to get their act together. Now, it is obviously a, a, a difficult negotiation. There's a lot of issues with respect to the implementation, the right numbers. But my view is that there is a rationale for them to do it. Uh, and it's probably in their best interest to do it, and they should do it. But there's a lot of, a lot of practical uh, considerations. Now, this, uh, the higher uh, the push the oil price, first of all, the bigger and faster is going to be the supply response and their reduction in market share. And second, and very importantly as well, the bigger the oil price, the faster the substitution into other fuels. So come your next car, if you feel there's uh, a threat, or there's a dependence or, you know, let alone any geopolitical issues, your decision to switch to an electric car or, or a gas fired or whatever it is, is more robust. So I think at the end of the day, uh, OPEC has lost 
uh, their oligopolistic power. Uh, and, and this is something that I don't think is uh, accepted or well enough un understood. And I think this is the, the dynamics and the balance, the, the dilemma that they face. Do we push it up knowing that it's going to come back and bite us in a big scale later? Or do we try to take the pain now and, and avoid that future uh, impact? And I think, you know, all in the MPV tells you, let's take the dollars today and then we'll see what the response looks like. There's too many alternative, uh, you know, uncertainties there. But it is, it is a difficult call. They've tried both things. Neither, neither uh, I think, has worked particularly well. But uh, it's going to be a, a very volatile market and these events are pretty binary and it's, it's just far from over. I think there's a lot of volatility ahead uh, on, on the crude oil space and I think in general overall within this long term trend of lower, uh, uh, abundant, cheaper energy is going to be a very bumpy road. So having discussed uh, a little bit uh, black gold, um, maybe it's a good idea to move on to, to yellow gold and uh, where a lot of the uh, interesting actions taking place, obviously the monetary policy side and, and what it means longer term. Oil and energy deflation has been clearly one of the inputs that has driven, in my view, monetary policy to where we are. Okay, uh, There's been chase for uh, or a reluctant uh, search for uh, inflation, uh, for growth, uh, where central banks have had the windfall benefit of, of energy deflation, giving them the ability and the excuse to basically cut rates uh, significantly. This is true in, in oil uh, importing countries uh, where there's been a significant uh, deflationary effect, be it Japan or, or be it Europe. And uh, through this link, I guess, uh, you know, things start to happen on the, on the monetary side. And uh, so, you know, a lot of my uh, focus over the past, uh, you know, couple of years has been really on this front. And uh, we've seen uh, what I would uh, describe, uh, or we are seeing today, the uh, beginning of uh, you know, a gold perfect storm. What uh, do we mean by that? What is a gold perfect storm? This is a framework uh, the, that has three phases. Uh, phase one is we are testing the limits of uh, monetary policy. Okay? The second part is we, and when I say we, is central banks and governments and the markets are testing the limits of credit markets. Uh, and these two cycles of you know, monetary policy and, and credit uh, eventually will lead us, in my view, if we continue this path, to test the limits of, of fiat currencies. Uh, which is what I would describe as a monetary super cycle or uh, uh, some kind of reset. Now, it's worth going into, into the parts in detail and just refresh our memory. And uh, also, I think it's very important that we uh, learn from past mistakes. And, you know, I, I like to compare a lot of what's happening today to, you know, what happened uh, or led to the, to the Lehman crisis, the so-called uh, you know, 2008 global financial crisis. In fact, I would call that the Lehman 1.0 and what we're uh, developing now is uh, I would call Lehman Squared. So I think when I look at uh, Gold Perfect Storm or Lehman Squared are really uh, two ways of expressing uh, the same idea. Now. Perhaps let me start uh, by drawing the parallelisms between uh, Lehman One and, uh, and Lehman Square. And I feel a little bit like uh, watching uh, West Side Story when you've already seen Romeo and Juliet. Uh, to me, it's the same story. Uh, but lots of people, when I talk about it, are like, Diego, but you know, uh, one is in, in Italy, the other one is in the US, one is in the uh, Middle Ages, you know, 1500s or whatever, the other one is in, in, in the 1960s or 70s. And, you know, one is leading with uh, noble, two noble families, this is two gangs, so what do you mean? You know, how can this be the same? But I think when you actually abstract the story and you understand, you know, uh, two sides, you know, girl falls in love, this, you know, kills the guy and, and, and the plot is virtually identical. And I think that if you uh, abstract the essence of, of the story, if you abstract the essence of, of Lehman One, and to be honest, Lehman One has lots of parallelisms with previous crisis anyway. But just uh, for the benefit of a recent memory, let's just look at what happened with Lehman, right? And, and, and you can take all the principal characters of the movie and the plot and do a perfect parallelism with what's happening now. 
In fact, this is an idea that we used in the book, in the energy book, as you remember, by drawing a parallelism between the uh, internet revolution and the energy revolution. And we were making parallelisms one by one, which was very helpful because it allowed us to introduce and coin key ideas such as the energy broadband. The energy broadband being effectively wiring the world through LNG floating pipelines in a similar way in which internet broadband wired the world. And we all know the impact that it had for the flattening of the world with India and China being connected overnight with technology in capacity for free. And same thing is the impact of LNG and some of the pipelines. So in that sense, I think parallelisms are really powerful. So let me walk you through the, the movie and the story. And basically, I think it all starts with a, with a miracle, right? With a technology, with something. So we know technologies have two sides. Nuclear uh, is obviously able to produce energy very cheaply and quite efficiently. It can also have fantastic uses for, for medicine and many other ways. But then it also has a dark side, okay? So uh, you can take any technology, internet or anything else, and I think we're going to face a similar dynamic. So Lehman One, at the end of the day, to me, it was taking a new technology to, uh, to the limit, okay? In that case, we're talking about securitization, okay? So suddenly, uh, you know, you can take a portfolio of crappy mortgages and suddenly create AAA products by having some, some residual stuff, right? So the technology of securitization, uh, it's great. It can actually allow, uh, you know, tranching risks and it's a, a very powerful tool but taken to an extreme and without the right regulation and the, the right oversight, uh, it can actually lead to, to problems. What happened with Lehman One? We have obviously uh, a new technology that creates a lot of value, uh, borderline miracle. Uh, we have the rating agencies that are you know, validating a lot of the, uh, the models and a lot of the ratings you know, with the benefit of hindsight. We know that those models uh, you know, underestimated the tail and, and how correlation uh, becomes one under certain events. So with this framework of we have a, a, a technology, we have, uh, you know, the players, the, the greedy arranger, the, the naive, uh, I would say the naive uh, lender, you have the uh, greedy slash, you know, naive borrower. But you have a dynamic where, uh, you know, we have lots of parallelisms. But in between, we have a key figure. And that key figure is what I call the acronyms. Okay, so the acronym is the weapon of this technology, right? So what was the, the, the acronyms during the Lehman crisis were the CDOs, the CLOs, the CDO squares, the whatever. So this uh, set of letters that, uh, you know, uh, had a cool name and, and a technology behind it. Now. What does an acronym do? What is it, in a sense? Well, it's a mechanism, it's a tool by which we lend a lot of money to the wrong people, in the wrong size, at the wrong price, arguably at the wrong time, right? That's really what CDOs and stuff, or many of these wrongly used, were doing. Now, if you fast forward to where, where we're today, the new technology that is producing the miracles is called monetary policy. The acronyms, very easy, QE, QQE, LTRO, and the long list. What are they doing? They're lending a lot of money to the wrong people, in the wrong size, at the wrong price, and the wrong time, right? So now this process by which you create this influx of, of money and stuff eventually uh, finds its way into building bubbles, okay? In the Lehman uh, One uh, crisis, it went to real estate, it went to fixed investments. It was, it was very much a channel that was very clear. Unfortunately, in this case, uh, the uh, money that is flowing into government bonds through effectively unlimited amount of buying and from the central banks through QE, and uh, which has been pushed to, to negative interest rates, and we talk about this, this is uh, having a spillover effect into many, many more markets in a much more global way, much more spread and much bigger which is obviously much harder to control. If you continue with the parallelisms with, with the movie, right, we had the rating agencies which were enabling or you know, validating a lot of this process. Unfortunately, in this cycle, that enabler, in my view, that role of enabler, the, 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 the one that is validating the whole thing is the central bank. Okay, it's 
in a way very worrying because who polices the police, right? On Lehman One, we would argue that the central banks in their supervision uh, role uh, were sleeping on, on, on the wheel. Uh, you know, it was with the benefit of hindsight, you know, we, we realized that there were excesses and lack of regulation and stuff, but, you know, the central banks were really caught, right? Here, I think they are actually in a very different situation where, in fact, they are the ones that are uh, incentivizing and building this, this dynamic. So, to me, is, uh, is, is one of the worrying dynamics of, of this cycle whereby, you know, who polices the police, right? Qui custodios ipsu custodios, I think they say in, in, in Latin. So in that sense, we're facing, you know, uh, this movie where we know how it ended in Lehman One. We are, it's really a continuation, it's a sequel of, of what happened. The technology is different, but yet again, we have a miracle. The acronyms and the impact and the sizes are huge. And this effectively phase one of testing the limits of monetary policy is doing something quite unprecedented, right? It is effectively creating what in my view is the biggest duration bubble in history, okay? You're looking at certain markets where uh, from uh, the snowball effect of central bank buying and unlimited buying and negative interest rates is leading to the price of bonds and fixed income uh, even breaking through through par, right? So no limits, <coughs> which is a complete new paradigm to the valuation of, of fixed income, which theoretically had a cap. So we're facing this dynamic, this behavior of babulistic, which is effectively incentivizing, but you know, incentivizing on in quotes, it to me is more uh, f forcing uh, investors to go and lend farther and farther and farther out. So in certain markets, now we're going 15, 20, or even the whole yield curve is, is at zero or negative, as it is the case in Switzerland and a big part of, of Japan and, and Europe. So we're facing this dynamic where testing the limits of monetary policy has led us to print very large amount of money where left pocket lends right pocket. So central bank prints money to buy uh, their own government debt. This creates a, a process, a snowball effect, uh, which has a crushing effect on yields. And because we are, we need that yield. We need, uh, you know, many a big part of the industry is structured around generating yield uh, or income. Effectively, people are being forced to lend farther and farther out and take uh, and do incre incremental duration risk. Are people aware of how much more incremental risk they're taking in the portfolios? I don't think so. So you will see people who've been lending happily for one year or three years that today might be lending for 15, 20, 25. When, if and when uh, those rates start to move, they're gonna experience volatility that uh, they don't expect and they're not necessarily ready for. So this phase one is, is kind of unstoppable, right? And this is leading to this perception that you know, central banks are infallible and at the end of the day, they have the ability under the current mandate or the current circumstances to do whatever they want and, and without limits by printing money and buying a certain uh, amount of assets and expanding those assets uh, way and beyond. So what's happened is this is basically, um, you know, what I would argue this is the cause, the epicenter of the crisis is not really where it will blow up. So I don't think you will see necessarily, uh, at least in first instance, the government bond market being the cause of stress because you have central banks who can actually step in. We would need to see a very significant change in leadership and, and philosophy, uh, you know, which, to be honest, with the elections coming and changes in, uh, in, in mandates, it's a, it's a risk. But nevertheless, I think this phase one of, of testing the limits of monetary policy so far is, is leading us to places that were unthought of. Negative interest rates is my, what I would call my Fukushima moment. That's what prompted me to say, oh my God, what's happening here, right? We're changing the rules. We are uh, sending uh, bond prices uh, above, zero coupon bond above par. Of course, if, if you were short, you've been uh, stopped out, they've been squeezed in. Uh, if you have a benchmark allocation, you're also forced to, to step back in. So uh, there's a lot of considerations, a lot of issues to, to look through. 
in what it means and uh, from a monetary uh, policy perspective. And this first phase effectively goes and leads very uh, clearly, very simply and very directly to phase two, which is testing the limits of, of credit markets. This is all about yield seeking. Okay, I can't get it where I used to. My bank account is paying me zero or is costing me money. My government bonds are paying me nothing. And this is not a coincidence. This is very much purposefully done in a way that central banks are saying, okay, guys, you put your money to work somewhere else. Yes, we're helping our own governments, but uh, you need to go and do something, right? So that leads to phase two, right? Testing the limits of credit markets. What it means is, you know, we have been incentivized, but rather forced to, to put that money to work. And what it means is we've been lending to weaker and weaker credits for farther and farther out to, to get lower and lower yields, okay? Now, credit as any other form of insurance, you know, just because uh, interest rates are, are negative, it doesn't mean life expectancy or, you know, car uh, accidents are gonna, are gonna change in terms of an actuarial basis. I think the risk is what it is, but there's a perception that things are under control. There's a, a central bank bid that is, is supporting the markets. And I think this uh, dynamic is based in this uh, yield seeking appetite is led to, uh, you know, what I think, you know, is a significant bubble. Uh, where we are and how long it will go and stuff, I, I, I don't know, time will tell. But certainly this yield seeking uh, into high yield, into emerging markets, into lots of, uh, you know, yield seeking. And what it does, is it creates a very interesting dynamic. It creates bubbles, clearly financial bubbles, but it also creates what I would call anti-bubbles or inverse bubbles. What do I mean by an, an inverse bubble or a financial spring? You know, something that you compress and eventually will go just like a bubble will inflate and pop eventually. Uh, what I mean are assets that whose value is uh, being mispriced on the downside. So we have assets that are mispriced. They're too expensive. They're assets that are mispriced because they're just too cheap. I will highlight two of them. One, you know, in my view is gold, and we'll talk about that later. But the other one, and I think very, very importantly, is volatility. Why is volatility an anti-bubble or an inverse bubble? Two reasons. One is fundamental, is the idea that central banks have been suppressing volatility, giving people the comfort that don't worry, markets collapse, I'll be there to, to support you, we'll come with more incentives, we'll even actually come in and buy physically the shares like in China or, or, in, uh, or in Japan. And you know, so we'll be there fundamentally supporting the market with uh, central bank put, which reminds me a lot of the OPEC put, reminds me a lot of that sense of complacency that the oil market had that of course oil is not gonna fall below 90 because OPEC will come in and, and, and cut. And my argument was like, are you sure? I mean, at the end of the day, at $100, they need to produce one barrel. At 50, they need to produce two. At 25, they need to produce four. So to, to keep their, uh, their income uh, all else being equal, right? So in terms of a, a revenue perspective. So I think that fundamental view of why a volatility is, uh, is, is low fundamentally and, and gets people comfortable selling it explains one thing. But the other angle is just pure uh, yield seeking. So if you're long uh, stocks, you sell cover calls. If you are uh, not long, you sell naked puts. The private banker calls you and says, I have this basket, I have this worst stuff. So you know, anything that will y generate some kind of yield is being monetized. And that flow of, of volatility, that real flow of supply of insurance uh, effectively leads to uh, implied volatility being lower and lower and lower. Now, what is the danger? The danger is that uh, if you take, for example, value at risk, VAR, okay, uh, it will, certain models will use implied volatility as input. So it actually gives a perception that the risk is lower than it actually is because A, you have a central bank uh, put, which to me is not as, as hard and as real as, as it might look. And also you have these inflows. So the problem is that when this unwinds and volatility effectively normalizes, and it probably overshoots on the upside, 
what it does for risk and for liquidity and, and for correlation is very significant. So you see other second order effects coming from a normalization of volatility and risk that lead to correlations being either plus one or minus one. Okay, a lot of the perceived correlation and benefits that you might see in the portfolio today uh, would not be there in a time of crisis and let alone liquidity, right? As your VAR increases, as uh, people need to get out, and we're talking about very significant sizes and stuff, liquidity can dry up. So you end up potentially with these six risks being lined up, you know, duration risk, which is unprecedented. We have uh, significant credit uh, expansion and risk with equities being, uh, at least historically, a put called parity relationship. So, you know, what's happening in the credit market translates directly into the equity market. But also, uh, uh, volatility being a very, very significant risk through the anti-bubble uh, and correlation and liquidity. So this is an explosive combination that, if applied on a global scale, uh, can lead us to a, what I would argue uh, could be a Lehman squared uh, scenario, which is not pretty and not necessarily the most likely scenario, but it's a, a real possibility. And I think that the current path is leading to, to some, uh, you know, that, that risk. So where does it put us, right? And what happens? Uh, now Trump comes in, uh, you know, there's been a few dimensions, directions in which, you know, we could have a debate about, you know, have the central banks run out of bullets. And, you know, I think the debate is quiet down a little bit, but there's been a lot of discussion about helicopter money and other ways in which, you know, you just create inflation pretty much on a one-for-one -one basis by, you know, giving up. Uh, and that's already a reality in certain parts of the world. It's just not in the scale that it could be done. But then the fiscal side is, is fascinating, right? And I think now with Trump, you know, coming into office, I think it opens um, effectively a whole new uh, chapter in terms of, uh, once again, pushing the limits of, of credit markets, right? It's let's borrow more, let's uh, build more. And I think uh, I love, uh, Larry Summers wrote this fantastic article. Uh, I, I had to read it several times just to make sure I was truly understanding. And I, and I have enormous respect for him, but uh, I, I have to admit it was, it was a bit of a shock. You know, it was called a prudent imprudence. And, and that article of a prudent imprudence uh, basically argued for uh, fiscal expansion, which in his view historically would have been an imprudence to be uh, the right thing to do, to be a prudent imprudence, right? So how do we read this? How do we explain it? And how do we justify it? Uh, there's a couple of ways to do it, right? But I think that the cynical perspective is to say, well, we are, you know, governments have certain amount of debt. We've been, central banks have been buying progressively to the point that uh, Japan, if I'm not mistaken, is already over, uh, you know, 40% of outstanding, uh, uh, basically the, the, the BOJ owns over 40% of the outstanding debt of, of the country, and it's buying uh, about 10% per year. So we're talking about unprecedented levels of ownership, unprecedented speed of accumulation of debt, to the point that fast forward a few years, you've run out of, uh, run out of outstanding debt, right? So you need the other, other things to buy. So. Mr. Summers, you know, argued uh, that during Maastricht we had a, a you know 60% uh, ceiling for debt to GDP. We had a 5% uh, prevailing uh, you know cost of borrowing, and then the argument was, well, listen, if if rates are zero or negative, then you can actually afford to borrow more. It'd be like you know your salary hasn't changed, but because the bank is lending you cheaper, you can actually afford a bigger house, which I think it's a bit dangerous to, to think that way simply because uh, there's a huge duration risk, right, in terms of what you can look in and how you're going to finance that. So the idea that, you know, we've been buying significant amount of, of that debt, which has led uh, rates to zero uh, or negative, you know, it's really not, rates are not a zero or negative because they deserve to be there. I mean, look at my country, Spain, right? I mean, it, what's fundamentally changed in the last uh, five years since we were at seven and a half percent in the 10 year bond and on the brink of collapse. Nothing's really changed that much to justify one extreme to the other, other than, uh, you know, no limits in terms of the amount of, of debt buying. So in this scenario, you end up with effectively a case whereby they say, well, you can actually increase the amount of debt because, you know, we're going to continue to buy this, which is putting a question into whether we are 
financing, you know, you use the monetary policy for financing purposes and what's the end game with debt monetization, a whole chapter. But I think the, the idea of fiscal uh, expansion and the imprudent uh, or the prudent imprudence is fascinating. Clearly, there are uh, parts of the world like the US, anybody who's been there uh, or, or lives there knows that there's room for improvement in, in many of the roads and, and certain infrastructure. Um, more questionable, to be honest, in China or other places where, in fact, uh, that tool is being used and, and abused to, to a large extent. So whilst fiscal policy and fiscal expansion, uh, you know, increasing the amount of debt can uh, have certain uh, benefits and be, be justified in certain parts of the world, it comes at the end of the day with the cost of an, uh, increasing the debt uh, and, and many of the considerations, right? At the end of the day, what are we doing? Crisis or you know, lack of uh, growth, and we just resort to more of the same. More monetary policy, more debt, right? How far can we go? And, and I think you know, the thesis is that you know, as we're testing the limits of these two legs, uh, eventually we find monetary policy and fiat currencies are two sides of the same coin. You cannot have monetary policy with gold-backed currencies. You know? The reason you can expand the monetary base is because it's a fiat currency. So one of the, my view, the argument is you know, as you push the limits of, um, and, you, and you destroy that, that tool, so goes the the faith in the in the currency and the system, and in that sense, you know we uh, we can go back in history. We can see uh, you know, and I think uh, Gresham's law provides a very simple uh, framework to try to understand what's what's happening today. And in that sense, Gresham's law has two phases, right? Phase one, whereby bad money replaces good money, right? And this is you know to put it in an example. We're in the Middle Ages, and we have a uh, you know currency that is backed by gold, either physically gold or or paper that is backed by gold. So I have a hundred units and a hundred units, and then uh, I send you and, and and the soldiers to to war, and I'm I'm basically financing the war by printing paper. Right now, uh, initially, uh, that paper nobody really knows how much more paper there is than the gold, and initially. Uh, Whoever smart says, well, I'd rather keep the gold and pay in paper. Uh, but there's a process by which that you know, bad money replaces good money. The gold disappears and the paper is changing hands. Now, at one point uh, when the purchase power and it becomes very obvious that you, know, you go to the butcher or you go to the baker and, and that paper is not buying you as much as, as, as you expected, uh, people might start to not want to take the, uh, the paper and they actually want the gold or, or some other way. So this is phase two, where basically good money replaces bad money. At that point, acceleration kicks in and accelerates in a very big way because you need a lot more paper in order to compensate for that uh, factor until uh, people start and completely lose faith, hyperinflation kicks in. And I think what's ironic is not even in, in historical cases, uh, not even the government accepted taxes in their own paper. So it was like, well, you know, no, 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 I don't, I, I don't want my paper, I want your grain. I want. And in those cases, you know, we even went as far in certain cases as to go into, into death penalty for people who wouldn't accept, uh, accept uh, paper back in, in China, even in Spain. So we, we are, in that sense, you see this dynamic, which the only way to stop it is to kind of reset the value and put some faith back in the system and the currencies. And what that is, is a repricing of gold. So if I ended up with a thousand units of paper and a hundred units of gold, effectively the price of gold would be 10 to one. And that is what I would describe as a monetary super cycle. That is a phenomenon by which, you know, the accumulation of paper uh, without being backed by something tangible, real, credible, or that dilution of the paper, whether it comes from debt forgiveness or any other way, will lead to potentially significant devaluations on the currency front, which if controlled, you know, they will lead to devaluations. If uncontrolled, they can lead to much bigger problems, which have second and third order effects. All that combined, to me, points to uh, the fact that, you know, we might be uh, accelerating and, you know, through the pushing the monetary policy without limits and what's happening in credit markets, and what, however iterations we have, 
as we try to address the new crisis, we are only using more of the same and eventually there's a limit. And as that limit kicks in, potentially we're, we, we might be seeing a, a scenario where you know, I think the dollar is very well positioned in a phase one to, to play that role of, you know, of good money. But I think that role ultimately could belong to, to gold. And, you know, some of the key central banks in the world, are, uh, China, Russia and others, are clearly uh, going that way. And I think that, that potentially justifies a scenario in a, in a monetary super cycle. So we're looking at a very big picture. Uh, a framework whereby we're testing the limits of monetary policy, how that is creating, uh, you know, probabilistic effects, impact and duration, how that is forcing investors to go farther down the line uh, in terms of, you know, credit, uh, the quality of the credit as well as the tenor, and then how all these dynamics potentially could unfold into scenarios where a repricing of volatility, correlation risk lead to having to take even bigger measures which could potentially uh, put certain pockets of the of the system at risk. So it's not necessarily a, a base case, uh, but I I think it's a lot more likely and possible than what the markets might be telling you today, which uh, is a very complacent uh, message. So then one, one of the uh, interesting dynamics is, you know, of course, when you look at the at the markets, uh, you have two considerations, right? One is the probability of certain thing happening, so heads or tails, 50-50, or you know, a blow up or not. Um, but on the other hand, you have obviously the severity of that event, right? And that asymmetry of outcome and that asymmetry of probability together are what will give you a sense of what the risk reward looks like. And I think it's very interesting to borrow uh, Mohammed El um perspective on this. And you know, I read uh, his book uh, earlier this year. Um, the only game in town, which I thought it was fascinating. And I, I do agree with him in many of the areas, but he presents a framework where having been known for uh, his new normal or PIMCO's new normal as, as a team, he has, you know, as you know, shifted his perspective to what he describes as a T-junction. Now, that perspective that living in a, in a new normal or boring, uh, you know, new normal or, or whichever way you want to call it, where it gives the perception that you just, you can do pretty much whatever you want. It's just fighting that, that boring uh, normality. Now, we are looking at a completely different outcome, which is, guys, there's a limit to how far you can continue to do this before you actually uh, hit a wall. And that T-junction that, you know, he describes, which is where, you know, I think in the book it says once, but uh, you know, if I remember correctly, within a three-year framework, which sort of is along the lines of what I'm thinking about, three to five years, uh, we're going to go either right or we're going to go left. Right? It's either going to go well or it's not going to go well. Um, now, repeatedly through, through the book, he gives it a 50-50 chance. Right? And this is what I call a, a diplomatic neutrality, because at the end of the day, uh, he's posing the risks. He, under, you know, describes why central banks, uh, you know, might be uh, limited in their ability to actually affect change, and how governments, uh, you know, are are the ones that should be doing this. So, I think fiscal and many other uh, considerations, more structural, are are what he believes is right. But uh, in, in that scenario, what is ironic, what is interesting, is that what is perceived as being neutral, I give a fifty percent chance of going right, fifty percent chance of going left. It's completely missing implicitly, okay, how much better off am I going to be on your 50% scenario where I'm right and how bad is the bad scenario? So in that sense, even a 50-50 probability outcome might be extraordinarily bearish considering the severity and the asymmetry of the outcome. And I think that's a consideration. So you be my guest by fine-tuning you know, what those probabilities look like. But I think what is very obvious is that I think we will agree that the, the severity of outcome, the asymmetry of outcome is potentially very significant. Uh, now, will it go right? Will it go wrong? You know, time will tell. But I think here is very interesting. I, I, I like to, to borrow, uh, you know, Soros uh, reflexivity uh, theory and how basically fundamentals impact prices, but prices also impact fundamentals, right? And there's multiple examples where you see someone that, you know, just by fact of a virtuous effect becomes better or markets like the, the European government bond crisis where 
you know, by virtue of price action, people that were generally okay were no longer okay. So the path dependency of prices and how prices can impact fundamentals and not just fundamentals impact prices is fundamental to my, to my thinking. And I think this is something that central banks have understood very well. They've said, listen, I know that I can influence the price. I may not be able to fundamentally change the, the economy, but certainly I think markets are way ahead of, of what the reality might look like. And this is the big bet, right? Do we, uh, are we going to catch up, you know, by virtue of unlimited bullets and whatever it takes to a point that actually we end up converging to that best case scenario, which doesn't give you a huge amount of upside, especially we're looking at, at equity valuations and others. And what happens if we fail? And this really explains to me why, you know, the central bankers are doing what they're doing and, and how they're doing it. Uh, in the sense that there's really no way to, to, to hide. There really, there's, you know, I think certain places we have passed the point of, of no return. I would argue that a country like Japan um, has very, very slim, if any, any chances of ever normalizing monetary policy. It's gone uh, and something will happen, but it's not going to be a normal, traditional, let's just hike rates and, you know, it's just not going to happen. Europe, I think, is more marginal, flirting with negative rates and potentially going deeper. It's, it's, and the U.S. is clearly leading the way uh, in terms of, you know, first on the way down as a first mover who had, and I think, capitalized on the main advantages of, of QE as a first mover, as a, as a first hitter. But we saw the law of diminishing returns kicking in, right? So how QE2 was already significantly less effective and QE3 had to be uh, QE infinity in order to, to have any impact. And I think this falls in the context also of what I would say the, the, relative th the relativity of, of monetary policy, right? The only reason, in my view, why Europe and Japan went negative interest rates is because the US was at zero. Had the US been at 2%, you would have not seen Europe and, and Japan going negative. So, in a way, I think whilst you know, my investment thesis of, of Gold's Perfect Storm and, and Lehman Square is built upon this, uh, you know, testing those limits. Whilst there's some signs of potentially starting to unwind, you know, uh, rates in the US and some of the uh, excesses of the past few years, I think some players are completely hooked and it'd be very hard to do it. And also time will tell how big the damage is already done. So the key thing is, can the US hike? Should they hike? Absolutely, yes. Now, it's not really about the US, it's not really about them, it's what happens to the rest of the world and how does that impact uh, them back. Um, so it's EM and I think it's China, it's, it's others. So uh, dollar China, not a lot of noise, it's off the radar, but it's already uh, approaching seven very fast, uh, a level that we would have thought you know, a year ago would have been catastrophic. So I think central bankers, a lot of credit to them on the truce in the currency wars after the G20 earlier in the year, how they've taken the opportunity of a stronger uh, yen and, and a stronger euro to, to, for China to, to, to devalue. Uh, and so I think all these dynamics are very closely interlinked. I think some of the abuses and, and damage uh, it's already done, but you know we will see uh, you know, if Elerian is right, if there's this 50-50 scenario, but I think what is very clear is that you know, we're looking at polarized uh, outcome. And, uh, you know, I, I certainly hope that I'm, I'm wrong with some of my, my fears, but I think that, you know, it's going to be a, a process that is, is going to be very, very, very bumpy. And uh, I think through that process, there's a lot of weak links that, uh, that could expose further dangers, which effectively kick back in the form of we have to provide more incentives and, and you know, we'll go back to the, to the cycle. I don't think we have uh, taken the approach of, of doing the, the structural measures or other solutions that, that we need. So in that sense, this whole framework, uh, what it means, how long it takes, what's the severity, what are the probabilities, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's evolving in front of our eyes. But I think clearly, uh, you know, we, we're taking some steps in the right direction, but there's significant uh, downside risks and a lot of asymmetry. What does it mean for gold? And, and, you know, we hear about the reset and the monetary super cycle. And, you know, even in terms of how do I invest in gold? And um, my view is, 
even if that happens, we're not going to go to the supermarket and pay with gold coins. Okay, that's just not what it means. If, even if a scenario where gold would be, uh, you know, there's a reset and gold significantly appreciates and and you know resets the value of old alt printing, effectively putting an end to to 45 plus years of since Bretton Woods. Even if that happens, it will be mostly a financial game where we are re claiming the, the trust in certain parts of the system that have been abused. It will be a reset in terms of you know, how far you can go with monetary policy, just like how far can we go with nuclear, how far can we go with uh, you know, securitization. All these technologies that have gone too far will eventually implode and then we, you know, we adjust and we use them more wisely and we learn from the lessons. So I don't think necessarily that uh, you, know, you will have that that physicality of gold being uh, true, it will be, but gold has, in my view, uh, an extremely asymmetric set of, of outcomes. I think uh, has arguably a few hundred dollars of downside in a scenario where, you know, uh, it's a very strong dollar, hikes, rates, uh, you know, go up significantly in the US, that gives room for the rest of the world to tighten up. And that happens in a scenario where it's considered to be a growth, benign scenario. Uh, so the markets actually are volatile, but hold, and you know it doesn't damage the, the economy. There, there's that scenario in which gold could have a few hundred dollars of downside. But on the other hand, I think the upside for gold is more in the thousands. So the asymmetry to me is very clear, and it would probably be quantum uh, steps in terms of uh, how far and, and how high it can go. But yeah, I think, uh, you know, in terms of what it means in terms of day to day uh, with our gold as a store of value, I think it's set to play a key role. Um, and it will be different uh, to, you know, uh, other physical assets. I think, you know, at the end of the day, certain scenarios would be equally bullish to anything that is real and is tangible, be it land or real estate or gold or bananas, right? Uh, there's an element of physicality to, to the commodity or to the assets. There's second order effects in terms of, you know, how much debt is there attached to it and does it behave like a real asset or, or a debt instrument? And I think, you know, that will show a lot of, uh, you know, polarization in the valuations of certain assets. But certainly, uh, certain unlevered real assets will benefit somewhat in parallel, but the monetary leg of gold is unique. And that applies, in my view, to gold, okay? So the basis and what you might see across, you know, certain pairs or commodities or historical correlations could, could break as part of this uh, super cycle.